Ted Williams says that the most difficult act in all of sports is to hit a pitched ball. As far as I can tell, the hardest thing is to see the ball. <laughs> I agree. When I, when I see the umpires calling the balls and strikes, I have no idea. I, I was thinking about this. I have no idea. They could be right. They could be wrong. And the only my estimate as to whether they're right or wrong is judged by everyone else's reaction. If they're outraged, I think they're wrong. And if they say, oh, yeah, 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 whatever, they think they're right. Well, but now they do have that little electronic thing in there. I can't see it. I don't I don't have that. I don't I don't have that kind of fast visual processing. There's a little rectangle that shows you where inside the strike zone or outside it the ball went. It's like the well, I mean, I haven't I haven't watched baseball in in a, a long time. I see. But when I used to go to the to the games, people that I sat with would say, "Oh, that's low and outside. Why? Why? Why was he? Why was he swinging at that? Oh, that's high and tight." I, I have no clue. What are you saying is? Back in my day, we didn't have them newfangled electronic displays. Why I had to tell about how the people cried in, in the stands. Is that it? Is that the kind of stuff I <laughs> But it is really hard to see a baseball. So I went to a website and I found the average velocity of every type of pitch. And the, slow, the, the fastest pitch is a fastball. And the fastest fastball that's ever been recorded, according to this website, is 105. Wow. 105. Well, that's his best. And at 105 miles per hour, it would take you around 350 milliseconds. So 0.35 of a second for that ball to get to the plate. Now, the slowest one is a knuckleball. I don't really know what that is, but okay, it's a knuckleball. And that would take around half a second, maybe a little more than a half a second to get to the plate. Do you really not know what a knuckleball is? Uh, I think it has to do with knuckles. Didn't Oil Can Boyd do knuckleballs? Oil Can Boyd? Oil Can Boyd? Jeez! Don't think I didn't follow baseball in my day. I just don't follow it now. I'm impressed. Oil Can Boyd was a long... I'm really impressed. 1986 Boston Red Sox. I, I am... Bill Buckner. Okay. I am not worthy. I am very impressed. All right. <laughs> I did I did retire. I officially retired from baseball in around 92. Yeah, so now you just watch football so you can watch people develop CTE. But that's a whole other thing. No, no, we're going to get back to that. We're going to end with that, okay? Right, so we're, so we get, we got, we're going to get back to that. So we got baseball, we got a, a, a slow ball that takes a half a second, and a fast, a really fast ball takes under... Takes a little under a 0.4 seconds. So, and, and of course... And so what? how long does it take to, to see that the ball has left the pitcher's hand? Okay. It's a, it takes... At least 100 milliseconds. And, of course, then and the batter has about... Has about 150 milliseconds that it takes just to swing the bat. Right. right. Even though they're fast. They're real... I, I remember watching... Okay, so then I moved from Boston to San Francisco, but I was not a Giants fan. I was a, a A's fan. And I went to a bunch of World Series, okay? Because my lab had, collectively, we shared some uh, some season tickets to the A's. So I got to see, I got to be in World Series. I mean, it was very cool. And and I remember watching Jose Canseco. It was in the postseason. I'm not sure it was a, it was a World Series, but it was in the postseason some, at some point. And he just, he just flicked his wrist, and the ball went way out of the park. And that, the speed with which they can move, I would say that's the hardware, his muscles that he can, he just has that power and that fast twitch muscle ability to move that, move that bat, move it. An old professor might say the, the speed of his skeletal muscles. Correct. His skeletal. Uh, but, but you, 
but so that's 150 milliseconds. So then you, you've got around another, I don't know, 150 milliseconds to plan what you're going to do, figure out what's coming and plan your action, which is crazy. We all know that brains make really fast assessments. And a lot of them are heuristics. This sort of looks like that, and sort of like that. But this is an extremely precise set of, well, okay, how does... Let's, what I, I would suggest that we break this into two. Let's talk about, here comes the pitch. I have got about a 10 millisecond, a hundredth of a second. There's a window when I have to hit that ball in order for it to go fair. Okay, so about 10 milliseconds. It's nothing. So I have to decide whether I'm going to hit it or not, whether it's a ball or a strike. And uh, and I have to decide, you know, basically where I'm going to aim in that in that 150 milliseconds. Or, or I have to appreciate that. So let's talk about the sensory appreciation of the incoming ball. And then let's talk about how we make that uh, that swing. So let's first talk about the set. You're getting this information and you've got a very short amount of time to appreciate whether you should go or no go. I mean, the, I, is, is there a I can swing a bat, but I can't see the ball and know where to swing it. <laughs> I can swing the bat now, but I, I'm not going to hit the ball. All right. So as I, we touch, so I, I can do it in a batting cage. Well, la da da. Good for you. At, at about 30 miles per hour. <laughs> I'm not sure I have ever hit a, a, a hard a regulation hardball, but anyway, but let's. It's okay. Oh, uh, we should go to a batting cage. That's fine. That's right. So yeah. now we yeah. started talking about this, and I hope we can continue about um, the two stream, two visual streams. Is that a fair? Thing? Right. Okay. So there's two visual streams. Remember that information comes into the retina, it goes through the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus, off to visual cortex. Visual cortex is a required stop. Back here, back here, yes. Uh, it's a required stop, but it's not sufficient. So you have to send the information from the visual stream, I'm sorry, from the visual cortex into these two streams, the dorsal stream, which comes up and tells you where, and the ventral stream, which tells you what. This is a and, baseball, and, and it's moving in this direction. It's moving forward, that's correct. And so... There are two places that I think are most important for assessing this feeding globe that is coming at you. One is the fusiform gyrus. Now, the fusiform gyrus, do you recognize that name? That's, that's the facial recognition part. Bingo. Good one. There's no faces on a baseball. The fusiform gyrus has the fusiform face area, which is exactly as you say, involved in prosopagnosia, you know, if you have a damage there, you may get something called prosopagnosia, where you have an inability to recognize faces. Are you going to tell me that it's more complex than I think? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you that the fusiform gyrus is involved in recognizing categories. So obviously faces are in the, in the realm of pack categories, what's more important than faces? Right. So we were we weren't born recognizing faces. We were born with the ability to make category visual categories and do that in the fusiform gyrus. So what do we do it with? We do it with faces because that's very important. That's the social uh, information. It's just critical to life to figure out what other people are. Who is this person? Will they give me food? Who is this person? What are their intentions? I got to make an estimate as to what they what they are thinking. So the fusiform gyrus says this is a baseball that has left this pitcher's hand. It's not a football. This, this is, no, I think it's I think it's a couple things. This is a knuckleball or a changeup. No, this is or a fastball. I, I didn't know this before, but as the ball turns, um, recognizable patterns. Yes. And so, for example, I thought one of the interesting examples was that for some, for certain types of fastballs... Rotates backwards, and a, to a pitcher, to a, a smart, really smart, visually acute batter, it looks like the ball has stripes on it. Two stripes, exactly. 
So some of the fastballs look like two strikes, and then the really cool one was the um, slider. It looks like a little dot. And then there's an angle to the line of the red that you see in the different things. So anyway, so they can categorize the pitch. And the and, and one idea would be that they do that using fusiform gyrus, a very well exercised, tuned, learned, acquired circuit in the fusiform gyrus that I don't have and you don't have, but Major, major League Baseball and Division One players now, have. Would this be... Uh, analogous to the fact that we are able to detect very subtle emotions in faces and we, uh, that are, are that the, cat, the category, I can tell if Peggy's unhappy or slightly sad, but certainly with Sharon, I can tell all kinds of things from just little, any right. subtle, is that the same kind of I think that's right so Giselle, has, Giselle can, can always detect when I'm lying even when I think I'm, I, even when I think I'm lying well <laughs> So that well, I mean, that it makes sense that we would, since faces are so important, that the fusiform gyrus would have some very sensitive detectors in there because we need we yeah. do tend to get a whole lot of information. So, so I think that the fusiform gyrus is is, is um, could be involved in categorizing the type of pitch, but I also think it could be involved in a in a orthogonal categorization, which is is the pitch good or not. Is it a ball or a strike? Should I is, should I launch or no launch? There is actually evidence from Sherwin and Maraskin uh, that fusiform gyrus is involved in that. Once you put it in the category, you can have a better idea. You can begin to estimate the behavior of that ball because you know how fastballs work. You know how changeups work. You know how curveball works. So once you've categorized it, that has begun to help you. I guess so. I, I Okay, so the other area that's involved in categorization... It, we know more about its its role in categorization. Um, we know a lot about it from, from work here in Chicago by Dave Friedman at University of Chicago. And this is the lateral interparietal area, or LIP. Everyone calls it LIP. This area, for example, if, if, you, if you say, I'm going to make everything that moves in that direction category one and everything moves in that direction category two it will learn that category boundary and if you then change that you're going to re redo it it'll relearn that category a new category boundary and and it not only uh is the neurons there not only code for category but also for location but independently so there's these two places where you've got this category. You're going to trigger, try and figure out whether it's a good pitch or a bad pitch, and you're going to find, try and figure out which kind of pitch it is. Um, now, what what's going to what's going to allow you to do that? 150 milliseconds is just not a ton of time. And well, as we talked about, what is the famous Yogi Berra thing? Yeah, so you 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 can't think and bat at the same and hit at the same time, right? Um, there's just no time. And, and one, a different way to think about this is that the game is won or lost when the batter gets up there before the pitch ever comes. In this sense, the amount of information coming into the visual cortex from that pitch, there is a finite amount, but it's very small and it's very late. So what does the batter, the experienced batter, have to go with? They have to go with their knowledge of the context. There are so many people on. There are so many people out. I studied the film of this picture, and I know that in three and one situations, he likes to throw a changeup. Exactly. Or they like to throw it high and away, low and in, whatever. So they are. They have already made. Uh, they've already restricted the possibilities for the incoming information. Okay. Very cleverly. So now you don't, now instead of needing, let's say you need a hundred units of information to figure out, you and I need a hundred units of information to figure out where to hit the thing. They don't need a hundred. They need 15 because the 85 is actually provided by their memories and their, and their experience and their practice, 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 practice. And, and that is built in to the, the circuitry of the thalamus. Two of the people that have 
advanced this notion the most are my chairman, Murray Sherman, and the late Ray Guillory. The two of them really thought about how the thalamus worked. Let's take the lateral geniculus. In the thalamus, and it's going to be the way that information from the retina gets to the visual cortex. The lateral geniculate, you would think, okay, well, it just gets ta- all this information from the retina and it sends it on to the visual cortex. No, no. About 4% of the input to the, la- to the lateral geniculate neurons comes from the retina. Okay, the rest of it, the other 96%. So about 40% of it comes back from the cortex. Oh, really? So this is a way that the cortex can tell the thalamus, this is where I, this is what I would like to see. Thank you very much. Wait, next. Please confirm my biases. But wait, so explain this again. So the, the information comes in from the retina, goes into the thalamus, that goes into the, uh, the uh, occipital cortex, and then back to the thalamus? Okay, and then, uh, so, and so that's that, that, so I see a ball, it goes into the, it goes into the, that, 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 that data, that visual data, that the thing that identifies red, thing identifies white, comes into the retina, goes into the hypothalamus, which sends it back to no, the... No, vision. not thalamus. Thalamus, not hypothalamus. Oh, not thalamus, thalamus, not thalamus. Yeah. Uh, and then it, it goes to the, to the, to the uh, occipital lobe, and, uh, where it's identified as a baseball. But, but it is only identified as baseball because... At the same time that it's getting this information from the retina, it's, it's getting this information from the cortex, which is all that information about that, that these baseball players know about what to expect. This is, oh, yeah. It's crazy. Why would you do that, Aaron? Why would so much information be coming back from cortex? Why is that a good way to build the system? Okay, let me think. Why is that a good way to build the system? Okay, I want to say like peer review <laughs> that the, the that the cortex is kind of checking. Okay, that's that, that's the best I got. That's what I got. Okay, the, the cortex is constraining. It's constraining what you're going to see. It's making it so much faster. Now you you know you, you might get blurry vision. It might be hazy. You might see it from a bad angle. Doesn't matter. You know what you're expecting. And it would take a lot of information from the outside to dissuade you from what you expect to see. Sounds like you're saying that I'm once again wrong uh, in thinking that this business about the dorsal uh, visual stream is an important player in the hitting of a baseball. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly important, but but everything is going through this bottleneck in the thalamus where you can bias the sensory input to what you expect in that situation, which is why a very experienced batter does a lot better than an inexperienced batter. A person who has played against a given pitcher does a lot better than a person who has never, who's experienced, but not with that particular pitcher. Every little bit of information that you can bring from your past experience into the situation, the better the performance. Bingo. We hope you enjoyed our performance in this episode of the Brain Buddies podcast and that you will join us for part two of Neurosciencing Baseball, coming soon to a content platform near you. In the meantime, please check out Peggy's blog, The Brain is So Cool, and my YouTube channel, Excitable Ape. This episode of the Brain Buddies podcast is jointly presented by the Chicago Society for Neuroscience and the Chicago Council on Science and Technology and is a production of C2ST-TV.